is Joshua Phillips for Math with Josh. Um, I decided to start a couple minutes early so I could run a nice long introduction that'll be good in the archive for referenced information. And yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit intro type stuff. See if we get some viewers or some chat comments. But I do have a good bit of content planned out. Okay, so we are live on Twitch. You're going to hear some echo here. A good bit of content planned out. Okay, so we are live on Twitch. Okay, we're getting the echo. Twitch, you're going to hear some echo here. We're going to get a content planned out. Okay, so we are live on Twitter. Okay, we're getting the echo. Twitch, you're going to get echo here. We're going to get a content planned out. Okay, so we are live on Twitter. Okay, so we do have audio. We are working. Okay, hello to everybody in the chat that shows up. So as you can see, and we'll move the picture now, um, we, were, we were teaching the dog to count today, sort of. Let's put him back at the bottom. And okay, so once again, I am Joshua Phillips. This is Math with Josh. Um, trying to introduce and start a mathematics homework help live streaming channel here on Twitch TV. You'll also, let me try and get all these written down real quick. Um, I can of course be found in the normal way, lots of other places. We have facebook.com slash math with Josh. I'm on Twitter. I don't have that account. I believe it's also math with Josh on Twitter. And uh, you can you can get in contact wherever you see my content, hear whatever, um, to send in homework or puzzles or any. Ideas for content or video series, etc. And I love some feedback. Again, yeah, this is the first real attempt at an episode where I have some math uh, pre-planned to talk about in a minute here. Okay. So hi everyone in chat. Um, that, that's like the very short intro. I'm going to start trying to do a math homework help show here on Twitch TV. Or help people with math, think you know a lot of K through 12 level stuff. Um, the college stuff, I can help with some of it. I'm starting to study stuff again. I didn't finish my degree personally, but I'm starting to work on you know studying a lot of the math on my own. College level, you can always ask. I might not be able to help, or I might not feel that I'm a sufficient master of the content for it to be okay to teach it. So without further ado on that front, let me clear this page a little bit here. Um, oh yes, also YouTube, Math with Josh, I'm there too. And pull up my little topic list here. So first, and I'm not going to, actually I guess I will show the whole puzzle here. There's a little bit of a copy over on my YouTube channel. And that was this weird little puzzle I ran into on Facebook. And the puzzle just showed... See if my drawing skills can hold out here. Uh, this is meant to be a regular t-shirt with normal sleeves and a normal collar. And then the question was, let's see if we colored everything in right. Yeah, so the question I got online that I ran into was, how many holes are there in this shirt? Now, 
a little bit of a hint, and you can turn the audio off for a minute if you want to try and figure this out on your own. Or, of course, if you're watching it in the audio archive, you can just pause it. Is that I think the question is a little bit awkwardly worded. And it's hard to give a hint without potentially giving it away. That The hint is the answer is kind of weird. Um, I think people, I saw a lot of different answers to this. And I think the truth of the matter is that it's kind of hard. Oh, that's what I need to do. To decide exactly. I don't know what they meant when they made this puzzle. But I'm going to make an interesting argument that I think, wait for it here, the answer, and you have to actually be specific, is that the number of holes can't be known for sure. We know it's at least seven and potentially any number bigger than seven. Put some, put some nice exclamation points there. I think that's the answer. Now you might that you might pop out and you might realize why I think that now. But to go through it, so I think we can all agree, without having to argue, that there's one hole here for the sleeve, there's one hole here for the neck of the t-shirt, there's one hole here for the other sleeve, and there's the hole at the bottom, and there are these two holes in the front. I think we're all on board with that. So six, that's easy. Like we're all we're all good there. I think we're good. Now the problem, and this is where I saw what I think was a lot of the interesting arguments over this little puzzle, is a lot of people when you tell them six isn't right, because six six is not right, they say, oh. Oh, right, there's holes in the front, which and we can see through the shirt, right? Because if if it were just six holes, the back of oops, the back of the shirt would still be here. And so there's actually, they say, eight holes. And now this is where the argument starts. Eight, I argue, is also wrong. The answer is not. Eight. It's potentially quite scary sounding right now. So why is it not eight? Well, let's draw the back of this t-shirt. Right, so we have the same outline. Um, the sleeves are intentionally drawn a bit um, clumsily, you might say, just because I promise there's not like a trick here, right? So this is like a very bad drawing of the outline of the shirt from the back. And there's somehow a neck hole here and you're suddenly realizing I definitely was not an art major in school. But imagine the back of the shirt here. Now we know, you know, this, this is the outline. Now we know we can see through the shirt where the two holes are. And a lot of people therefore assume, I'm gonna draw them to kind of match up here. Assume that means there's a hole on the back here and a hole on the back here. And that lets us see through the shirt. Right, these line up with the two holes on the front. And so there's eight total holes because there are the four you know, normal holes a shirt has plus two in the front, two in the back. Here's the key and why the answer is that it's at least seven and potentially any number bigger than seven. We don't know how many holes are on the back. So first, there could just be one giant hole that lets us see through both holes in the front. Right, so if we try and draw those in, Right. The view from the back could be like this. It could be the case that from the back, oops, I did that wrong, that there is a hole in the back, but we see the front of the shirt with the two holes in it. It is one big hole. And on top of that, 
just to save a little bit of time drawing. There could also be additional holes on the back that we can't see from the front. So there could be a hole here, there could be a hole here, there could be holes in the back of the sleeves, etc. And what that means, in my opinion, is that the correct answer is to say there are at least seven holes, but we can't rule out or narrow it any more beyond that, setting aside the fact that there can't be 10 billion holes for practical reasons. So that was a neat little puzzle I ran into. Watch quite a lot of Facebook argumentation over that video, which was good fun. Um, you can check out my YouTube. I sort of run through that explanation again. Let's clear the shirt drawing off here. Do, 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 do. So I did prepare a little bit of additional math for the day. Now the idea for the show, and the idea for math with Josh, was to, how did I want to put this, you know, provide a place to get live math homework help. That was a goal. Um, to focus on teaching math in an engaging way. And, of course, to have some fun talking about math, puzzles, etc. So I wanted to show for tonight because it's the first episode. I don't really expect to have too many viewers. As I'm watching, I've had one or two people in chat for a couple minutes. So I just wanted to show a little bit of how I try to approach explaining math, um, how I try to talk to hopefully make my explanations work better than other explanations you've encountered with the idea that we want a show that is accessible insofar as the topics we're talking about are simple. Um, for doing a day of calculus, obviously, um, calculus is going to be hard for first graders to keep up with, and that's it's okay. So let's just look at something relatively simple here, which is how to do long division just the process. And by just the process here, I mean that I'm not going to really justify why this works. We're going to show how we do the method so you can understand what you have to do to solve the problems. I actually think the understanding is extremely important. The other side of that, though, is I think it's okay to focus on teaching the process and trying to make sure you've explained the process very clearly. It's a good articulation. Explain it in a literal, mathematical way and hopefully imply a lot of the stuff that often needs to be explained. So let's just look at a long division problem. Um, I don't have these prepared ahead of time, so let's say uh, 487 divided by 3. Now when you're doing a long division, you might be dividing by a single digit number, you might be dividing by a two digit number, or a three digit number, and so on. And the way I'm going to explain this, it's the same exact process regardless of what your initial number is. It's just a little bit trickier when it's a bigger number you're dividing by. So the first step is we look at the first digit of what we are dividing. In this case, that would be the 4. And we say, okay, is our... Are we dividing by a number less than 4? And the answer here is yes. Okay. What's the biggest multiple of 3 that is less than 4? Now, obviously, this is 1. So we write the 1 on top because 2 times 3 is 6, which is bigger than 4. So we write the 1 here. And we write that, that product. So 1 times 3 is 3. We then subtract the top number from the bottom, or the bottom number from the top number. 4 minus 3 is 1. 
We then bring the next number down. It is an eight. We, uh, as it's called, concatenate it, I believe is the term, but you, you bring it down and put it on the end of the previous remainder. And we say, okay, three is obviously less than 18, so we won't have to write a zero. What is the biggest multiple of three that is 18 or less? Now, you might, you might need to try and figure this out. So we'd say, okay, I know, so maybe, maybe you know that three times five is 15. So then you're gonna try something bigger. Okay, let's try three times seven. We realize, oh wait, that is 21. We went too far. And there was, oh, three times six, that's exactly 18, that's convenient. So we found out that six is the biggest number we can multiply by. So we write a six in the next digit. On top, we write six times three under the 18. So we're writing 18 under 18. We then subtract these numbers. 18 minus 18, since it's itself, we will get a zero. We will then bring the seven down. And we'll do the same thing. What's the biggest multiple of three that is seven or less? Um, that will be two. Two times three is six. And seven minus six is one. Now, if we had another number to bring down over here, we would bring it down and keep going. But instead, we have a one. And we have nothing else to bring down. Um, for today, for this version, we're just going to then write there is a remainder, which we'll indicate with a capital R, a remainder of 1. That's normally how you're shown this when you initially learn long division. Um, not to get into it right now, but it's not exactly what you would do in the long run, but there is a remainder of 1. Um, some common... Now let's look at a couple things. Let's back up in my work a little bit here. Okay. Let's just go back to this stage where we said, okay, 18 minus 18 is zero and bring the seven down. Now a common mistake that trips people up is they pick too small of a multiple, which is okay. You, you have to just learn your times tables. Um, there, there's a certain amount of practice to it and intuition and building that up over time. But let's say that you mistakenly thought that one was the biggest multiple. You said, okay, one times three is three. We subtract and we get four. Now, one thing you have to always look for is when you subtract the number you get here before bringing anything down has to be smaller than this number you're dividing by. If it's not, we need to erase and back up and try a bigger number on top. And again, as we said before, two works here quite well. That's a very common thing that catches people. And if you don't back up, you end up with answers. You will generally end up with a wrong answer. Um, I've seen people make two mistakes that offset unintentionally. Now let's look at another one that's a little bit harder. Um, I want to emphasize here that the way I explained that, I hope, implicitly tells you what to do when dividing by some bigger numbers. Okay. Excuse me. So let's say hypothetically, or you know, for, for our practice for today, Let's say you had the problem um, 1,211 divided by, oh, let's say 13. Now, the way I explained that before was designed so that you would, to hope that you would notice we don't change the process. It's a little bit scary, maybe. It's a two-digit number we're dividing by. 
maybe a little bit intimidating, but the process doesn't change. So we say, okay, or right, we have 13 here. What we want to check is, now we can skip the first step if we want to, but let's just do it the long way. Okay, well, 13 divide one, no, so we can, we can write a zero here. And in practice, we often don't do that. And we'll just write, okay, what's well, one minus zero? That's still gonna be one. We bring the two down. Will 13 go into two? No, so we'll write a zero again. A little bit weird, but we'll write that zero. We'll subtract zero again. You may be noticing in practice here that you can skip these steps, but it's okay to do it the long way and, and try and catch on as you go. Now, after we bring this one down, 13 is definitely going to go into 121. And the question is, we need to figure out how many times. Well, 10 times 13 is going to be 130. Because when you multiply by 10, you can just add a zero to the number you're multiplying by 10. So we know 13 times 10 is 130. Well, that's too big, but it's close. So my guess is we only need to go one more step down and try 13 times 9. Well, 13 times 9, I'm going to write this out. Instead of doing my head, 3 times 9 is 27, carry the 2. 9 times 1 is 9, plus 2 is 11. Okay, so that equals 117. And since we know times 10 is too far up, we know that times 9 is our best answer. So we will write a nine in our next digit. Nine times 13 is 117, as we just found out. 121 minus 17, well, we cross the two out, carry the one the other way. 11 minus seven is four. One minus one is zero, one minus one is zero. So we get four. We bring the one down. Now let's try and count these in our head. One times 13 is 13. Two times 13 is 26. Three times 13 is 39, which is definitely gonna be our answer here because four times 13 is gonna be 40, 52, you know, 52. So we're just gonna go three. It's four times 13 would be too big. 3 times 13 is 39, as we said. And 41 minus 39, 11 minus 9 is 2, 3 minus 3 is 0 is 2. So write a remainder of 2. And of course, if it divides evenly, you just don't put the remainder at all. You do not need to put a remainder of 0. Okay, so stepping out of that now, um, having watched for a little bit. Um, so that, that's a good demonstration, I think, how to, how I approach just explaining the process of things, trying to explain in a way that makes it more likely you will copy the process correctly in general and not hiding the fact that some of the problems will get harder. Um, I've seen explanations of division that lead to incorrect assumptions about how it works with double digits. So I like to try to talk in a way that gets around those. Ooh, let's cover that up too. So let's see, I've been on for about 30 minutes. So once again, uh, thank you to everyone who's watching. Just another little brief intro before I jump into the next section. Feel free to jump two minutes ahead if you're watching this recorded. 
Once again, my name is Joshua Phillips. This is Math with Josh, a new live math homework and math show I'm trying to start. You can find me at facebook.com slash Joshua Phillips Mathematics. You can find me on YouTube as Math with Josh. I'm also on Twitter under the same handle. And I can be contacted with homework problems, ideas, feedback, whatever, anywhere you're seeing the content. But today's sort of a proof of concept. I wanted to make sure I like my setup. I wanted to have an archive to look back at, and I wanted to say hi to Twitch TV. So hi, Twitch TV. Um, showed the long division. The second thing I'd like to show tonight, oh, I guess third, we had that nice, the uh, how many holes in the shirt puzzle that's led to some arguing with my friends on Facebook. So the third thing I'd like to show and it has a nice little narrative story around it. Um, it's about an Algebra 2 level topic um, called FOIL multiplication. And it goes by a few different names. I believe the correct mathematical term is the multiplication of polynomials by each other. Um, normally we do. It's called FOIL multiplication. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, FOIL multiplication which again is an Algebra 2 topic, um, is the idea that if we're multiplying, let's say, x plus 1. Ooh, I can't use x's here. So the x's are variables here now, everybody. Um, x times 1 times, lesson for the next stream, I need to figure out how to draw a better multiplication symbol, times x minus 2. Now the FOIL, let's get some bigger letters here, FOIL stands for first, outside, inside, last. And that means the answer to, a, the answer to how we multiply this is that first we multiply the first two together and we get x times x is x squared. Then we multiply the two outside terms. Note the negative 2 is a negative 2, not a minus 2 in this context. So we get minus 2x. Then we multiply the inside terms, which are the 1 and the x here. So we get plus, because they are both positive. And we can just abbreviate 1x as just an x. And then we multiply the last terms, which are 1 and negative 2. And we will get minus 2. And now we check to see, and in practice it will always be the middle two when it's set up just like this. But we check to see if any of our terms can be combined and in this case, the middle two can. If I can select the correct brush size, at least that is. And we'll get x squared. Combining the middle terms, x minus 2x is going to be minus 1x, which we can just write as minus x, minus 2. And that's how you do FOIL multiplication. But I have a neat little story here, which is when they teach us in Algebra 2 often, or perhaps college-level math, or, of course, whatever the Algebra 2 class equivalent might be called wherever you're in school, <clears throat> is that kids often have no idea where this is coming from, why it works, why we're doing that, etc. And what I like to show people is that there's a really good intuition for why this works. I think there's a certain argument that it is, in fact, a proof of why it works. And what I'm going to do for this one is I'm going to show you the basic idea with all positive numbers, and I leave it to you as a sort of homework assignment to think about how this would work with negative numbers. 
or yeah, negatives. Now the thing I notice, and we'll get to my story after that, is that FOIL multiplication is the question of is there a useful identity for the answer to what is a plus b times c plus d? Is there a useful property that lets us solve these without guessing at random? And there is. Now if you back up to elementary school, we know that area is the same as is a multiplication problem of some length times some width. And the neat thing with FOIL multiplication is that we can represent it as a multiplication problem. Do excuse my horrifically drawn, ooh, that was too bad. So, stream notes, I need to learn how to draw rectangles better. So let's draw this rectangle Note that we don't really know the proportions of it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the height of this rectangle, which you also call the width, is that it's A plus B long, which we're going to indicate by breaking the line here. And it's C plus D wide, which I'm going to indicate with the break here. Now let's pause on this for a second. And notice that the area of this rectangle with height a plus b and width c plus d is equivalent to the answer of what's a plus b times c plus d. So that's quite cool. Well, that hasn't solved how do we calculate this because we just have some letters floating around. But again, it's an area problem. So if we, if we draw these lines clear across, and again, I apologize that my lines are never very straight. Ooh, pretend that's a straight line. Okay. If we extend these lines, we realize the figure can be seen as, a, as four rectangles. And again, we don't know the proportions this drawing is just a stand-in to see why it works. But this is now four rectangles with areas we can calculate. This rectangle is A tall by C wide, so the area is AC. This one is B tall by C wide, so it's BC. This one is B tall times D wide, so it's BD. And this fourth one is A tall times d wide, so it's ad. And now we might notice something very peculiar that is explained where FOIL comes from. So ac, this is the first two numbers. ad, this is the outside values. bc is the inside values. And bd are the last values of the polynomial. Again, this isn't quite a proof. This is a partial explanation. And I'm actually leaving as a homework or thought thing, if you're watching this, um, does this work with negative numbers, this explanation? You have to check that. Um, right, does it work if there's a zero in there? Is that, is that weird? Etc. Oh, and the second part is you can wonder how would this change? Let me try this. So here's a good another good homework question besides making sure this works with negative values and making sure it works with some bigger things. Which is imagine we had a plus b plus f times c plus d plus g. So it's a 3 by 3 multiplication. Is there a similar geometric idea that explains 
how we would get this to go beyond the basic idea of FOIL multiplication. Put that up for a second so you can look at it. I think it's a very good little problem to think about. Um, now the story about FOIL multiplication um, is that I showed the, the basic geometric idea that is just to put a simple version up on screen for a second. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who you know, has significantly more education than me in mathematics. And I showed him this little picture with the, with the letters. And I said, this is why FOIL works. And I think an interesting sign of how math education is often flawed is that even though he knows more math than me, and has done a lot more with it, is when I showed him this, his response was, wait, there's a reason that algebraic property works. It hadn't occurred to him that FOIL multiplication had a simple geometric interpretation that justified it. It wasn't that you had to figure it out as a weird counterintuitive, I don't know if counterintuitive is the right word, but a weird thing that was just true that you could prove analytically that there was a neat, simple, physical account of where it came from. Oops. So once again, let's see if I had some other stuff. Okay, so I covered what I wanted to talk about for today. Um, I'm not sure when I'll have the next show scheduled for. As I said, this was one thing. This was a nice test. I feel pretty good about it. Be able to look back at the video and see what I need to change. I'm always looking for the feedback and stuff. Let's see. Yeah, so I'm going to go off the air a little bit early now. Um, thank you very much to everyone who watched. Please leave feedback if you see this later on YouTube or whatever in the live stream. Um, it should be on Twitch. I think it'll go over to YouTube automatically. And if you have any homework you'd like to see explained, any math puzzles you ran into that were neat, can't guarantee I'll solve math puzzles, but I'll try. But anything like that, please send it to me. Feedback, ideas, math topics you'd like me to talk about. Um, there's a final little bit of the outro I should have mentioned at the beginning. I'm going to do math tutoring. I want to start trying online. So you can get in touch if you're interested in that. I run about $25 an hour. But we can talk about that. Especially when we're testing out the new online. I'll definitely give a discount to the first person who mentions that I just said that. So thank you very much to everyone watching. This is Joshua Phillips for Math with Josh. Have a nice day, and I'll see you next show.